In chapter 32, we're going to be taking a look at the diversity of all animal groups, as well as investigate the evolutionary relationships that exist between them. Despite being extremely diverse, animal groups do share certain fundamental characteristics with one another. For example, all animal groups are diploid. In other words, they all possess two complete chromosome sets. Furthermore, all animals are eukaryotic, as well as being multicellular, with all of their cells organized into specialized tissues. With regards to nutrition, all animals are heterotrophs and exhibit extracellular digestion, in other words, digestion within a body cavity. With regards to locomotion, all animals are modal at least at some point during their life cycle. They can reproduce asexually or sexually. And with regards to their development, all animals arise from specialized embryonic cell layers known as germ layers, something that we'll be taking a closer look at a little bit later on in this presentation. According to this phylogenetic tree, all animals, which can be divided into two main groups, the parazoans, which lack true body tissue, only represented currently by sponges, and the eumetazoa, which do possess true tissue and include all other animal groups, can trace their ancestry back to organisms known as coanoflagellates, which existed about 700 million years ago in the Precambrium. Now, this phylogenetic tree is based on molecular and structural homologies. And if we examine modern coanoflagellates, we see a striking similarity with regards to their cells and the cells that comprise sponges, the simplest of all animals. This does suggest coupled with molecular evidence, a close link between the coanoflagellates and all animal groups. Thus, we can say with a high degree of confidence that coanoflagellates are the closest living relatives of all animals. As I previously mentioned, all animal groups can be placed into two general categories based on their level of complexity. The parazoans lack true body tissue. In other words, the cells are not really differentiated. They're more or less all the same. The only living representative of the parazoans are the sponges. And as I previously mentioned in the last slide, their cells bear a striking resemblance to those of modern coanoflagellates. Eumetazoans include all other animal groups and they do consist of true tissues, whereby the cells in each tissue type are specialized for carrying out a specific body function. The eumetazoans can be further subdivided into two groups based on the body symmetry that they exhibit, either exhibiting radial body symmetry or bilateral body symmetry. Eumetazoan animals that exhibit radial body symmetry are placed in the group radiata. These animals, by and large, adopt a sessile or non-modal lifestyle. And natural selection would have favored an even distribution of sensory equipment throughout the entire body so that the animal can respond appropriately to stimuli in their environment no matter what direction the stimulus was coming from. All of the eumetazoan animals are placed in the group bilatera, for they exhibit bilateral body symmetry. These animals, by and large, are mobile, and therefore natural selection would have favored the concentration of sensory neurons towards the head end or the anterior end of the animal's body. This is an evolutionary trend known as cephalization, with the root ceph referring to head or brain. This trend would have been adaptive because the head end or the anterior end 
is the region of the animal's body that is entering into a region first. And therefore, it allows the animal to quickly and appropriately respond to any changes or stimuli in the surrounding environment, whether that be the appearance of a predator, the appearance of a prey, or any other vital stimuli that must be quickly and appropriately responded to. With regards to the nature of the embryonic development that we observe across animal groups, after fertilization and the establishment of a zygote, the zygote begins to cleave or split mitotically. And of course, with each round of mitotic division, the number of cells associated with the embryo doubles. Eventually, mitotic cleavage will establish an embryo consisting of a central hollow. At this point, we refer to the embryo as a blastula, often known appropriately enough as the hollow ball stage of embryonic development. That hollow within the center of the blastula is known as a blastocele. The term seal refers to empty space or cavity. Incidentally, it is at the blastula stage of development that we as humans reach our mother's uterus and ultimately implant ourselves within the uterine lining. Following implantation of the blastula, it experiences a process known as gastrulation, where the outermost cell layer of the embryo starts to fold inward to establish what are known as three germ layers of stem cells known as the ectoderm, the outermost stem cell layer, the endoderm, the innermost cell layer, and in some animal groups, a third stem cell layer will form between the endoderm and the ectoderm, known as the mesoderm. Notice how reduced the blastocele becomes as a result of gastrulation. In addition, we establish another space known as the archenteron. As embryonic development progresses, the archenteron will develop into the digestive system of the adult body. So therefore, the archenteron sometimes is referred to as the embryonic gut. The opening into the archenteron is known as the blastopore. In some animal groups, the blastopore will develop into the mouth. In other animal groups, it will develop into the anus. Now, with regards to animals that exhibit radial body plans, gastrulation only gives rise to two germ layers, the endoderm and the ectoderm. As a result, all animals that exhibit radial body symmetry are referred to as being diplo blastic. Conversely, all animals that exhibit bilateral symmetry exhibit three germ layers as a result of gastrulation, the endoderm, the ectoderm, as well as a mesoderm, and as a result are referred to as being triploblastic. As you might expect, bilateral animals that are triploblastic will have more complex body plans as a result of that addition of the mesoderm germ layer. What question that we want to address now is exactly what type of adult tissue each one of these germ layers actually gives rise to. The following table summarizes the developmental fates of the stem cells that are associated either with the ectoderm, the endoderm, or the mesoderm germ cell layers. With regards to the ectoderm, cells of the ectoderm can give rise to the epidermis of the skin, as well as structures associated with the epidermis, the cornea and the lens of the eye, the nervous system, including the brain and the spinal cord, tooth enamel. With regards to the endoderm, as you can see, it generally gives rise to the lining of most of the major organ systems of the body. In addition, it could also give rise to organs such as the liver, the pancreas, 
and the thyroid. With regards to the mesoderm, if it is present, as we would expect in organisms exhibiting bilateral symmetry, it gives rise to the skeletal system, as well as skeletal muscles, and various other body systems, such as the excretory, reproductive, circulatory systems, and a point that we will stress going forward, the lining of the body cavity. Bilateral and triploblasts that are regarded as being acelomates include flatworms, such as planaria. These animals lack a coelom or body cavity that would otherwise exist between the wall of the digestive tract, which is derived from the embryonic endoderm, and the outer body wall, which is derived from the embryonic ectoderm. More or less, these animals would have solid bodies. The digestive tract of such animals is regarded as being incomplete, for there is only one opening associated with the digestive tract that serves as both a mouth and an anus. Bilateral and triploblasts that are regarded as being pseudocelomates include roundworms, which are mostly intestinal parasites, and animals known as rotifers. These organisms do have a cavity that exists between the digestive tract and the outer body wall, and are thus said to exhibit a tube within a tube body plan, the inner tube, of course, being represented by the digestive tract, and the outer tube represented by the body wall itself. With regards to the digestive tract, it is also described as being complete because it's associated with two openings, a mouth on one end and an anus on the other. Therefore, the movement of material through the digestive tract is unidirectional. Now, the advantage of a body cavity like a pseudocelum is that it allows the internal organs to move independently of the body wall. So therefore, any movement of the body wall isn't directly transmitted to the internal organs, therefore protecting them against physical trauma. Now, the reason the term pseudocelum is used to describe the body cavity of these animals is because the body cavity is only partially lined with muscle tissue that is derived from the embryonic mesoderm. If this was a true coelom, as you can see here, the entire cavity would be lined on all sides with muscle tissue derived from the embryonic mesoderm. Bilateral and triploblasts that are regarded as being coelomates include animals such as mollusks, annelids, arthropods, echinoderms, and chordates. These organisms all exhibit a true coelom, which is a body cavity that is completely surrounded by muscle tissue that is derived from the embryonic mesoderm. With regards to the digestive tract itself, it is a complete digestive tract, as is the case in pseudocelomates meaning that the tract is associated with two openings, a mouth at one end, an anus at the other, and it exhibits a unidirectional migration of material. Bilateral and triploblasts that are regarded as being coelomates can be classified as either protostomes or deuterostomes. Protostome coelomates include annelids, arthropods, and mollusks, whereas deuterostome coelomates include chordates, and echinoderms. Inclusion into either one of these two groups depends on the manner in which mitosis occurs during early embryonic development, the timing at which stem cells begin to differentiate into adult tissue, and the developmental fate of the blastopore, which if you remember is the opening into the archenteron or the embryonic gut. With regards to the manner of embryonic cleavage that is observed among protostome coelomates, like mollusks, annelids, and arthropods, it is observed to occur at an angle that is acute to the vertical axis of the embryo itself. As a result, when viewed in profile, the cells of the embryo seem to be offset with regards to the cells immediately above or immediately below it. 
so it is often described as exhibiting a spiral pattern. In contrast to what we observe among protostome coelomates, the manner of embryonic cleavage among deuterostome coelomates, such as echinoderms and chordates, is often referred to as being radial. In this manner of embryonic cleavage, the direction of mitosis, so to speak, occurs either in the same plane as the vertical axis, in other words, parallel to the vertical axis, or perpendicular to the vertical axis. As a result, when we view the embryo from the top, all of the cells seem to radiate from the center of the vertical axis, hence the term radial embryonic cleavage. The timing at which the stem cells associated with a protostome coelomate embryo is often regarded as being determinant, which is to say that the differentiation occurs very, very early on, as early as the four cell stage. As a result, the loss of any one cell from the embryo, even at this early stage in development, will not lead to the development of a whole individual. Rather, it would lead to the development of a specific tissue type. As a result of this early differentiation of stem cells, identical twin development among protostome coelomates is not usually observed. In contrast to what we observe among protostome coelomates with regards to the timing of stem cell differentiation, um, what we observe among deuterostome coelomates is often regarded as being indeterminate. For the developmental fate of those stem cells is not fixed early on. Therefore, at the four cell stage, if a cell were to fragment from the main embryo, it does have the potential to develop into a whole individual that is genetically identical to one that arises from the original embryo itself. Therefore, among deuterostome coelomates, identical twin development is possible. Another way that we can differentiate between embryonic development in protostome coelomates as opposed to deuterostome coelomates is the developmental fate of the so-called blastopore. Remember, this is the opening into the embryonic gut, also known as the archenteron. It turns out that in protostome coelomates, mollusks, annelids, and arthropods, that blastopore will develop into the mouth opening associated with the digestive tract. Whereas in deuterostomes, echinoderms, and chordates, that very same blastopore will develop into the anal opening. Last but not least, protostome coelomates and deuterostome coelomates differ in the manner in which the coelom, or the body cavity, arises. With regards to protostome coelomates, the coelom arises from a patch of mesoderm tissue that develops between the outer ectoderm and the innermost endoderm. Once this solid mass of mesoderm becomes established, it begins to split. As it splits, the mesoderm begins to open up and it creates a cavity. That cavity represents the beginnings of a coelom and as a result of it arising from the splitting of a solid mass of mesoderm, it is completely lined with tissue derived from this layer in the adult body. This manner of um, coelom development is known as schizocele. Schizo, or schism, quite literally means to split referring to the splitting of that solid mesoderm. In contrast to what we observe in a protostome embryo with regards to the development of the coelom, in deuterostomes, what we find is that the endoderm of the um, archenteron, which is the, of course, um, 
embryonic gut, we have mesoderm starting to develop. It starts to bulge out from this endoderm layer. And it separates from this endoderm layer, as we can see here. Then from this solid patch of mesoderm, as is before, it begins to split, it begins to separate, and it begins to open up to form the beginnings of a coelom completely lined with tissue derived from the mesoderm germ layer. Because of the fact that the mesoderm that gave rise to the coelom originated from the endoderm of the embryonic digestive tract, we refer to this method of coelom development as enterocele. The prefix entero actually means or refers to the digestive tract. Another hallmark characteristic of the animal body plan is the fact that animals exhibit bodies that are segmented. In other words, each portion of the body, whether it be the head, the thorax, the abdomen, is associated with specialized structures that enable it to survive within a given environmental context, whether that be for obtaining nutrients, for escaping predators, for flight, reproduction, etc., etc. Now, we first observe the evolution of segmentation in the ancestors of annelids. Uh, modern representatives would include earthworms and their cousins. But as you can see, within annelids, the segmentation is very, very simple. In other words, each body segment is more or less the same as every other body segment. So it is not a very elaborate form of segmentation. But in arthropods, we can see that segmentation is extremely well developed, as is the case in all other animal body plans.